This is Chapter 9, Introduction to Social Stratification in the United States for Sociology 1. Okay, so what is social stratification? Sociologists use the term social stratification to describe the system of social standing. So social stratification refers to how a society categorizes the people into rankings of socioeconomic tiers based on factors like wealth, income, race, ethnicity, education, and power. In the U.S., people like to believe that we all have the same equal chances in life. So if someone is at the bottom of the social stratification hierarchy, it's because they're responsible for their rank. So it's because they choose to be poor. Sociologists recognize that social stratification is a society-wide system that makes inequalities apparent. Stratification is about systematic inequalities based on group membership, social class, and other factors that we'll talk more about when we cover race and ethnicity, gender and sexualities. So the structure of society is responsible for a person's social standing as social stratification is created and supported by society as a whole. So social stratification is a characteristic of society. It persists over generations and is maintained through beliefs that are widely shared by members of society. In a stratified society, groups at the top of the hierarchy have greater access to goods and services than members of groups at the bottom. So we find that several different systems of stratification are operating right now in the United States, where it's not hard to demonstrate that being wealthy, white, or you know, cisgendered male typically confers a higher status and all that goes along with it on a person than does being poor, non-white, or female, or even you know, trans or non-binary. Because social inequality affects a person's life experience so profoundly, it's worthwhile to examine how stratification works to understand this as a social phenomenon. So when looking specifically at wealth and income, both wealth and income are related to social stratification of socioeconomic classes, but they're different and they mean different things. So income is a person's wages or investment dividends. So basically the money you make at your job or on your investments, while wealth is the total value of money and assets that a person has minus any debt. So wealth is made up of more than the money earned. It includes things like the value of a home, a value of cars, stocks, bonds, other real estate and businesses. So I think my favorite example of this was um, the wealth of John McCain when he was running for president um, against Barack Obama back, back, way back in the day, what, 2008. And John McCain was asked, how many homes do you own? And he didn't know the answer. He didn't know how many homes he owned, right? Like, how rich do you have to be <laughs> to be like, you know, I'm not sure how many versus myself. If someone says, how many homes do you own? I say zero. <laughs> right? But um, for most people, even if they do own multiple homes, they they wouldn't know how many. Right. But um, because he's married to an heiress, um, he's worth a lot of money or he was. Um, you know, it, it kind of <laughs> just shows just how disconnected sometimes people are that want to represent Americans from the actual workaday Americans that they want to represent. So when we look at the distribution of wealth in the United States, income is unequally distributed. With the highest earning one fifth of the population, they receive about around 50% of all the income. So think about that, of all the income in the country, but 50% of it is going to just the top one fifth of families. And so this is more than 13 times as much as the 3.7% of income that's earned by the bottom one fifth of families. So that's obviously an unequal distribution. But when it comes to wealth distribution, wealth is distributed much more unequally than income is. The richest 20% of families control nearly 90% of all privately owned wealth, while at the same time, the poorest 20% have no wealth at all and are actually in a lot of debt. So when we look at more recent economic changes in the U.S. and how this has affected stratification, as a result of the Great Recession in you know, 2007, 2008, many families and individuals found themselves struggling like never before. The nation fell into you know, a prolonged and exceptionally high unemployment 
and the lower class was hit the worst, right? Like I remember um, that quote, Trump said that the recession was good for him, right? Unlike what the book says, it was good for some people. It was good for bankers who destroyed the world's economy, but still got golden parachutes, right? It was good for real estate investors like Trump who took advantage of higher than ever foreclosures to flip homes and gentrify neighborhoods. But when the recession hit poor people, they got their hours cut, they lost their jobs, they couldn't pay their rent or mortgages, and there was a huge increase in the homeless population as a result of that you know, structural change. So this has been paralleled by the recent closures and economic consequences of the pandemic. Though in fairness, through the checks the government dispersed, as well as the child tax credit, where parents got a couple hundred bucks extra each month for each kid, that ended up cutting child poverty in half during the pandemic. So Republicans blocked continuing those payments in September of 2021, and families have been struggling more since then. And we saw big piles of money being, gov being given to businesses to keep them afloat, and again, to individual citizens to help them, as well as additional unemployment benefits that got many people through the hardest financial parts of the pandemic. So there was also a student loan freeze and a moratorium on evictions, which helped a lot of people, though some of those things have and are ending. And, you know, that shift back to normal means a shift back to that normal inequality. So if we hadn't had increased benefits and stimulus checks and, you know, the child tax credit and other payments through the pandemic, we would be in a much far worse place financially right now than we are as we recover from the worst of the pandemic. But overall, the trend towards increasing economic inequality is still happening. The problem is getting worse, and that's why it needs such urgent attention. We see when doing research clear patterns of rising levels of economic inequality in the United States. It's harder than it's ever been in generations to get by. So my generation is the first in a while that's expected to do worse than their parents or grandparents' generation, which is a big change from previous generations. And this inequality is more obvious than it's ever been, especially through the Trump era when tax legislation gave the biggest tax cut to billionaires, more so than any previous legislation. This is part of the old Reagan trickle-down economics, which is complete nonsense and not supported by data. In reality, if you give poor, working class, and middle class people more money, that money invigorates the economy, while billionaires can never spend anywhere near what they earn. So the adage of job creators it's just another rich person myth used to justify how obviously unfair the system is. Surveys find the majority of people feel the U.S. economic system is rigged against them, and it's rigged against them in favor of the wealthy and in favor of corporate interests. So um, there's a figure in your book that examines the share of income earned by the 1% from 1913 to 2015. In 1929, the richest 1% earned about one-fourth of all income. And what happened in the late 20s? The stock market crash. Right, which caused people to develop laws and other policies to try to address inequality. As a result, from 1929 to 1980, the share of income to the richest 1% declined. But by 1980, due to the elephant ignored in this analysis, Ronald Reagan, the share of money going to the 1% began to increase it dramatically, right? peaking in 2007 at nearly the same level it was in 1929. And what happened in 2007? The recession. So now it's increasing again, and even more so when the Trump tax cuts of 2018 took place, which was the largest transfer of wealth from the poor to the ultra-rich in American history. So this is an ongoing developing issue, but it does have some clear patterns, as we'll discuss when we talk about the economy. And so when it comes to taxation, the government collects, collects taxes for three reasons. To operate the government, which takes money to do so, to discourage behavior, and really as a tool to redistribute income and reduce inequality. But when you let the corporations of rich people have a million loopholes, then the intent of the system is undermined. So progressive taxation is a model where your tax burden goes up as your income increases, or the idea that if you have more money to spare, you can help more. So those people that are you know, more worse off can face less taxation. We have a system like this, but the problem is the wealthy have great lawyers that can circumvent tax laws and the laws became even more skewed after the 2018 tax cuts. And I should point out that we are the wealthiest country in the history of the world with a handful of billionaires who live here 
and have made tens of billions of dollars during just the pandemic, when the rest of us were facing pay cuts, layoffs, unemployment, job security, less stability. They made money, ridiculous amounts of money. These same people did not pay taxes at all for some years, like Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, Michael Bloomberg, George Soros. Bloomberg was the guy who bought his way into the 2020 presidential race, right? He was the guy I mentioned that spent like almost, you know, a billion dollars. It was um, 936 million plus dollars um, to run for president for like a month. And that analogy I was talking about where the media was comparing Bernie Sanders to Bloomberg because saying, well, they're both in the 1% while um, Bernie's a millionaire because he sold a bunch of books. So, you know, the idea was if you make a dollar every second, right? Every second you make a dollar in 11 days, you'll be a millionaire, but it'll take you 31 years before you're a billionaire. There's a big difference between millionaires and billionaires and just be someone as rich as Bloomberg. It would be almost 2000 years you would have to take of having getting a dollar a second before you could have the kind of wealth that he has. And again, this is not just about individuals. Again, almost a hundred companies have paid zero taxes since 2018. I believe it was 91 huge companies, um, such as Netflix, JetBlue, uh, Levi Strauss, Whirlpool, Goodyear Tires, Delta Airlines, Chevron, FedEx, General Motors, Halliburton, Starbucks, Amazon, Dow DuPont, Avis Budget Rentals, Alaska Airlines, Activision Blizzard, Duke Energy, MGM Resorts, and so on and so on and so on for nearly a hundred companies that could absolutely afford to pay taxes. I mean, there are probably five Starbucks within a mile, right? They're not struggling. So, um, you know, there's this great video about this from Robert Reich that talks about how wealth inequality has really spiraled out of control as a result of these changes. Okay, so looking at some systems of stratification, for some reason, your textbook skips a few of the systems of stratification that I would add a little info here. Again, you're not going to be tested on it if it's not in your book, but I feel like you need to know these things to gain a larger context of the issues. So first of all is slavery, right? Slavery is the most extreme form of social stratification. It's based on the legal ownership of people. Slaves are not considered to really be people in the social stratification hierarchy. They're considered the property of slave owners. And this is the most extreme form of stratification because individuals who are enslaved have no access to pursuing the resources available in society and no opportunity for social mobility, which we'll discuss in a few minutes. So as much as we think of slavery as the past and why are we still talking about it, blah, 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 modern day slavery persists right? Illegally in many forms around the globe. You have some people that are trafficked into domestic labor. You have people that are, you know, uh, trafficked into sex trafficking. Um, there's fishing industries that are rife with modern day slavery, etc. So an estimated 21 million people right now are working in slavery conditions in the world. Not to mention that the 13th amendment that outlawed slavery here in the United States has an exception so the exception to slavery is why we have prison labor. So basically the exception is that you can still, you know, face slavery as punishment for a crime, right? That's the big asterisk of the 13th amendment. So you have prison labor where people are able to trade time in prison for incredibly small wages, such as in California where convicts are used to fight fires and work 12 to 18 hour shifts on the front lines of fires, but they earn a dollar an hour for their work. And many, many corporations profit off of prison labor in the U.S., so it continues. All right, moving on to this ones that your book actually talks about, caste system. This is a kind of system without social mobility. So a caste system is a form of social stratification in which status is determined by your family history and background, so it can't be changed. India is the country most closely associated with the, the caste system, even though it has been dismantled its residual presence in Indian society is deeply embedded. Also, um, you know, part of this kind of understanding of a caste system could be, um, you know, apartheid, right? This is the term for the system of segregation of racial and ethnic groups that was legal in South Africa between 1948 and 1991. So, um, you know, this, this kind of system, apartheid, the segregation of racial and ethnic groups, um, you know, it was legal and South Africans were legally classified into four main racial groups, white, 
meaning English or Dutch heritage, Indian from India, colored, meaning mixed race, and black. So blacks formed a large majority, about 60% of the population. And the, but these groups were geographically and socially separated from each other. Blacks were forcibly removed from almost 80% of the country, which was reserved for three minority groups. And, re, and they were relocated to these, what they called homelands, similar to the kind of reservations style that happened in the United States. Um, they couldn't enter other parts of the country without a pass, and even if they did get a pass, it was usually just to work as a guest laborer in white areas. So ironically, um, African-American visitors that were visiting South Africa were given the title honorary white, and they were given status where they could move freely around within white and non-white areas. And this was kind of a way to engender the normalcy of such a horrible system of, you know, um, caste system um, to outsiders. So, of course, you know, through armed struggle, um, that system of apartheid was, you know, destroyed in the early 1990s. Um, but again, it came with great cost to the people that organized. A lot of people were um, kind of, it's interesting, a lot of people parallel South African apartheid to the civil rights movement in the United States. And there's some parallels we'll talk about in chapter 11. But really the real difference is while here people were beaten or you know um sprayed with fire hoses over there people were just shot with live ammunition so um it developed a different movement to kind of counter that violence anywho let's move on to the next system of stratification class system so class system is based on both social factors and individual achievement so a class consists of a set of people who share similar status with regard to factors like wealth, income, education, and occupation. So class systems are not closed like caste systems are. People can change their social class sometimes. Sometimes it can happen through marriage, through their jobs, or through education. So a meritocracy is kind of the ideal, right? It's the ideal system that we want in America. It's based on the belief that social stratification is just the result of personal effort. And it's considered an ideal because a society has never existed where social rank was purely based on merit. So meritocracy meaning if people are at the top, it's because they just worked harder than people at the bottom. And that is a system that we want, right? Something based on your personal effort. But we do know that that has just never fully existed in any, any society. And then status consistency, another term for your book, describes the consistency or lack of consistency of an individual's rank across the factors of income, education, and occupation. So what's interesting is sometimes some of these things are more privileged than others, right? So because maybe you, um, you might be very poor and you might have a working class job, but maybe you have, I don't know, a PhD from Harvard or something like that, and that would be a status inconsistency. So um, oftentimes when we think about social class, it is a kind of complicated um, situation because there's many factors at play in determining someone's social class. Okay, so let's look more at social stratification and mobility in the U.S. So the standard of living in the last hundred years has increased quite a bit in the U.S., meaning the level of wealth available to people to acquire material necessities like you know, having a comfortable bed or having clothes that don't itch you, right? Those kind of comforts to maintain lifestyles. So standard of living is based on stuff like income, employment, social class, poverty rates, and housing affordability, which is why that is decreasing, right, in the modern era. So standard of living is really related to quality of life. As when you live in a capitalistic system, right, everything costs a lot of money, and if you have a lot of money, you're golden right? If you don't, you're going to struggle and definitely not live comfortably. In the United States, a small portion of the population has the means to achieve the highest standard of living. A Federal Reserve Bank study shows that a mere 1% of the population holds one-third of the nation's wealth. Wealthy people receive the most schooling, they have better health, and they consume the most goods and services, um, you know, without having to worry about that. Wealthy people also wield decision-making power that middle class and poor people just can't. So many people think of the United States as a middle class society, 
They think a few people are rich, a few are poor, but most are fairly well off, existing in the middle of the social strata. But there's not an even distribution of wealth. Millions of people, right, struggle to pay rent, to buy food, to find work, and afford basic medical care. Women who are often single heads of household tend to have a lower income and a lower standard of living than their married or male counterparts. So this is a worldwide phenomenon known as the feminization of poverty, which acknowledges that women are disproportionately the ones who make up the majority of individuals in poverty across the globe. So in the United States, as in most high income nations, social stratification and standards of living are, you know, based on occupation. So what kind of job you have affects your standard of living, right? And really can influence your social standing. So it's beyond just how much you make at your job, it's how much prestige your job has. Meaning, you know, being a engineer versus being a waiter or, you know, being a lawyer instead of being a bus driver, right? Some, it's actually kind of funny, like depending on what, how uh, profitable your law practice is, that bus driver might be making more money, but it's not just about the money, it's about the prestige of some jobs over others. So the most significant threat to the relatively high standard of living that we're accustomed to in the U.S. is the decline of the middle class. The size, income, and wealth of the middle class have been declining since the 70s, largely because wages have remained stagnant for the majority of the population since the 70s, and the amount of wealth and income going to the 1% has increased dramatically. So it's occurring at a time when corporate profits have increased more than 141%, and CEO pay has risen by more than 298%. So while a lot of economic factors can be improved, like dealing with the inequitable distribution of income and wealth, or the feminization of poverty, or stagnant wages for workers while executive pay soars, you know, we're fortunate that the poverty that's experienced here is most often what we call relative poverty, not absolute poverty. So absolute poverty is deprivation so severe that it puts survival in jeopardy while relative poverty is just not having the means to live the lifestyle of the average person in your country. Okay, so when you look at social classes, you know, part of what we want to understand is the relative power and control that people have over their lives based on their social class. So the upper class not only have power to control their lives, but also enough social status to control the lives of others. And this is kind of the distinction often between the middle class that doesn't generally control others, but can control or have some control over their own lives versus the poor, the lower class have very little control over their work or their lives. So the upper class is considered the top and only the most powerful elite get to be up there in the top, right? So um, obviously we've heard of this with the 1% that, you know, have the majority of the wealth of the entire country. But, you know, money is beyond, it's beyond just buying stuff, material stuff, right? Money also gives people access to power. So you have members that are, you know, in, that are very wealthy, that they, because of their jobs, like maybe at corporations, they can make decisions that affect the lives of millions of people. Also, if they own media companies, they can influence the collective identity of the nation, right? So right now we have the situation where, you know, almost 90% of all media is controlled by six companies. So if you're on the board of one of those couple companies, what you put out there when you own all the TV, all the radio, all the newspapers, all the magazines, all those things at the same time, um, you're able to really strongly influence the kind of collective identity of the entire country. Also, they're the board members on, you know, of the most influential colleges and universities. Um, they give a bunch of money to politicians to fund campaigns, often to, you know, kind of remake the laws in the interest of what would benefit the wealthy. So the power is, is used in many ways, right? Not just to buy stuff, but to control what people think, um, whether it's what they learn in school, um, what kind of laws are made, and really even, you know, um, how politicians vote on things. So the middle class is, is different. 
it's funny that most people consider themselves middle class, even though that's not the reality. Um, it's interesting in sociological research, we always say you can't just ask someone like, what's your social class? You have to actually look at like, what's their occupation or what's their income? Because sometimes you have people that make 30 grand a year and, you know, they think, okay, well, I'm the middle class. And then you have people that make over $200,000 a year and think, well, I'm the middle class. And they're both wrong, <laughs> right? So it's interesting, though, that all we ever talk about is the middle class, like culturally. So it makes sense that a lot of people think that, especially if you hear politicians, they are always talking about the middle class. So that can really affect our perception that everyone is in the middle class. So um, there's even within the, the middle class, there's like upper, middle, and lower of the middle class, if this makes sense, because it's a, you know, kind of sliced into a couple chunks there. So the people that are in the upper middle class, they tend to be the ones that have those professional degrees, right? And they tend to work in fields that pay a bit, like, you know, business or law or, you know, maybe they're doctors, um, while lower middle class members are more likely to have, you know, um, bachelor's degrees from like a four-year college or maybe an associate's from a community college. Um, so they make enough money to have a decent standard of living, but not the same as those people at the upper end of the middle class that have like very comfortable lifestyles. So comfort is the key concept of the middle class, right? So middle class people, they work a lot of hours, but they have comfortable lives. They have comfortable um, homes and nice cars, and they can actually have time to spend with their kids and they can, you know, potentially go on vacations, things like this afford all of the expensive stuff in society, like healthcare. While in the lower middle class, you have a lot more people that are just kind of working those uh, middle management jobs, right? And so they can, you know, they come with a little prestige and slightly higher paycheck sometimes, but, you know, this is going to mean that they still don't really have enough money to go on those vacations, to have a lot of savings, to really move up that much. Um, and when budgets are tight, lower middle class people are often the ones to lose their jobs or kind of slide from the lower middle class into the upper lower class. Um, and then the lower class is just often what we call the working class, right? Um, largely, there's an educational difference on average between people in the middle class and the lower class, meaning oftentimes people in the lower class um, are working jobs without an educational background. So this affects their income. Um, or, you know, they're often working in jobs that, you know, might not require education. So working class people are the highest subcategory of the lower class. Um, so a lot of our work industry nowadays is like a service economy. Um, working class people are often doing the most physically demanding jobs of those jobs. Um, and then beneath the working class is the working poor. Just, they're like the working class. Um, they often have low paying employment, but their jobs rarely offer any benefits like retirement or health care. So their jobs may even be seasonal or temporary. Um, and so the real question comes down to in the wealthiest country in the history of the world, how can people work full time and still be poor? Even working full time, millions of the working poor earn incomes that are too meager to support their families. So the minimum wage varies from state to state, but it doesn't support a family of four in any state, and it will not pay for a decent two-bedroom apartment in any state, right? The federal minimum wage is still seven twenty-five. So this obviously affects likelihood of mobility. And so social mobility just means the ability to change your social class, right? The ability to change positions within the stratification system. So if you can improve your economic status, you move up social mobility. But if, let's say, something negative happens and you go down, that's also something that can happen as well, right? So social mobility can be upward or downward. And again, upward re refers to an increase or upward shift in social class, right? Um, sometimes it's that rags to riches story, but really it's more like education and marriage are often the ways that people move up, right? Like people say, oh, they're marrying up. Um, while downward mobility is you know people moving downward often like let's say you hadn't like you invested in something and you failed right all your bitcoin went away <laughs> right stuff like that um or it could really be something like a disability or an illness that makes people um you know kind of drop out of the working world in some ways 
which, and even this could be like dropping out of school or getting a divorce, right? Things like that. There can be a loss of income and status that cause a downward social mobility. So we look at intergenerational and intragenerational mobility slightly different, but really the idea is that, you know, it's not uncommon, at least previously, for generations of a family to belong to varying social classes, right? So intergenerational mobility is the idea that, you know, maybe your grandparents were very, very poor and they saved and they, you know, kind of got things together and then your parents generation had a little bit better situation and they worked hard and they did their thing so that you have a better situation than your parents or grandparents right that's kind of part of this American narrative but um, it's a little bit different than something like intragenerational mobility so this is when you can move up and down a social class in your own lifetime and so this is why you're in school right <laughs> because we know one of the biggest impacts on inter intragenerational mobility is education, right? So that's so good on you. All right, um, so structural mobility happens when societal changes make it so a whole group of people have to move up or down the social class ladder. So this is basically because of a change in society, not because people like, it's not like in 2007, everyone was just like, I'll just quit my job, right? They all got laid off. So that's a structural mobility. Right. So sometimes there are things that are happening in the economy that are beyond our control. Right. Recessions, economic setbacks, things like that, that can create waves of downward structural mobility. OK, so then looking at global stratification. Right. It's not just in the U.S. that we face stratification, but it's interesting how much global stratification is really connected to past colonization. So global stratification compares the wealth economic stability, status, and power of countries across the globe. Global stratification highlights worldwide patterns of social inequality. So in the 19th century, the Industrial Revolution created unprecedented wealth in Western Europe and North America. Due to mechanical inventions and new means of production, people began working in factories, right? Not only men, but women and children as well. And by the late 19th and early 20th centuries, industrial technology had raised the standard of living for a lot of people in the U.S. and Europe. But the rise of the Industrial Revolution also saw the rise of vast inequalities between countries, those ones that were industrialized, and the countries that weren't industrialized. So some researchers like, you know, um, in your book they talk about Walt Rostow, suggested that, dis that the disparities between the countries really result from power differences between the countries. So he looks at this through a conflict theory perspective, saying that the nations that industrialized took advantages or took advantage of the resources of those non-industrialized nations, right? They plundered them. They often took those resources from them, whether it be, you know, the gold or, you know, the diamonds or whatever it might be. And they used those resources to become rich. And while extracting them from other nations that could have been rich, but all of their minds were taken to one of these colonizing countries. So sociologists study global stratification and analyze economic comparisons between nations as well. So we'll look at things like income, purchasing power, and wealth. And this is used to calculate global stratification. So this is also looking at the kind of quality of life that people have within a country compared. But again, it's complicated to compare across countries because countries have, you know, such unique histories and experiences that sometimes it's difficult to compare them to each other. So oftentimes they're kind of compared against other similar countries, right? And there's different models of stratification. In the past, they had models that are now considered outdated, like saying first world, second world, third world. Um, those are pretty outdated now. Um, but other models look at countries and put them into two groups, ones that are more developed and ones that are less developed. So more developed nations have higher wealth, like Canada, Japan, Australia, and less developed nations have less wealth to distribute. So this could be you know, um, some countries in South America and Central Africa. So the system, though, that we use the most when actually looking at um, countries across, you know, those kind of boundaries is um, the GDP, right? The gross domestic product. So basically a country's average national wealth per person. 
And so this is like a measure that makes it a little bit easier to compare countries' rates over you know, time and across different varying countries in the world. Um, so they help really understand our standard of living. And in low-income countries, it just means there's got to be more poor people relative to that in more rich countries. So citizens will have less access to clean water, electricity, plumbing. Um, they not, might not be guaranteed education, so that means many people will be illiterate. And the life expectancy because of poor health and, and you know not having systems like electricity and clean water leads to a lower life expectancy for people that live in you know those lower income countries. Okay, so how do the different theoretical perspectives understand social stratification? So functionalism first. In sociology, functionalist perspective looks at how societies, you know, different parts operate, right? Those puzzle pieces that fit together to form a whole. So they're always looking at functions and dysfunctions. So what would they say is the function of social stratification? Well, there's this thing called the Davis-Moore thesis, which basically argues that there's a greater functional importance of a social role than the greater the reward must be for having it. So the theory argues that social stratification just represents an inherently unequal value of different work because some tasks in society are more valuable than others and qualified people are the ones that need to fill those jobs so they should be rewarded more than people who are not qualified. So according to Davis and Moore, like a firefighter's job is more important than like a grocery store cashier because the cashier does not require the same skill and training as a firefighter. But without the incentive of higher pay and better benefits, why would someone be willing to rush into a burning building? So Davis and Moore believe that rewarding people with more, for more important work, meaning giving them more money and prestige, encourages people to work harder because they want to be at the top of those ladders. So Davis and Moore basically said that in most cases, the degree of skill required for a job is what determines the job's importance right? Or that if you need, let's say, more training, like if you got to be a doctor and you have to go through several years of school, several years of residency before you can even, you know, cut a person open or whatever, that there's going to be fewer qualified people that are going to be there to do those jobs. While some jobs like, you know, um, answering a phone doesn't require as much skill and you don't necessarily need a degree. So those people shouldn't be paid as much basically, right? So conflict theorists would say that that's, um, <laughs> they would be critical of that because they would say that um, we don't all start on a level playing field. So the Davis-Moore thesis kind of ignores the existing social stratification of society. The idea that someone becomes a doctor only for the money is like, well, maybe they do, but also who can become a doctor is really influenced by what kind of neighborhood they grew up in. Um, what kind of social class our parents had as to what likelihood of a higher education they have. So conflict theorists are deeply critical of social stratification and they argue that it really benefits some people but not all of society. So conflict theorists believe that social stratification just perpetuates inequality. So they want to bring awareness to inequality to show how rich society, you know, if it has this many poor members, it's a choice. So conflict theorists draw on the work of Karl Marx who saw workers as being alienated and you know miserable because of having no power and no status. So he argued that the proletariat were oppressed by the bourgeoisie and that they needed to come together to kind of foment a rebellion to overthrow that class system. So today, while some working conditions have improved, conflict theorists believe that the strained working relationships between employers and employees still exists as capitalists still own the means of production. and. That means they're going to keep getting rich while workers continue to be poor. So according to conflict theories, the resulting stratification is what leads to class conflict. And then moving to symbolic interactionism, remember, they're the ones that say that we make meaning when we interact with each other. So they examine stratification from a micro level perspective, trying to understand how do people see themselves and other people so, and their social class and how that perception affects their interactions with each other. So in a lot of communities, people interact with, with people that really share the same social characteristics, meaning 
they tend to live, work, and associate with other people that have the same background. So this could be the same racial or ethnic background, but really the same educational background, but really the same social class background, right? We're, we live in pretty segregated society. So this kind of built-in system of social stratification groups people together. So, you know, symbolic interactionists really look at how, you know, we come to understand our social class in those parameters. And, you know, for instance, they look at how people's appearance reflects their perceived social standing, right? So it's a, it's a performance, meaning, um, for example, here, here's an example that I've done myself, um, symbolic interactionism, for a couple weddings I've had to go to. Um, there's this site called Rent the Runway, if you've ever heard of it, where basically you can rent like a crazy expensive designer dress for like 50 bucks and even the fancy jewelry to go with it, which definitely pay for the insurance for that because you don't want to be on the hook for like $500 earrings. But anyway, in those couple times I've had to be in real rich spaces, I've basically cosplayed as a rich person <laughs> using something like Rent the Runway um, as a way to try to make it seem like I, I was supposed to fit within that space, right? So oftentimes the way that a person appears is how we perceive their social class. So if they have like a fancy car that indicates social class, their hairstyle, their, their housing, the what clothes they wear, that kind of stuff really can affect it. But then again, as you see with influencers, that stuff can all be kind of a performance as well, right? So it's really about the perception we get from looking at people, which a little bit can be gamed, right? And then a little bit, just the last part here is about conspicuous consumption. So to symbolically communicate with social standing, people often engage in what's called conspicuous consumption, meaning they buy stuff because they want to make a social statement about their status. Right. So, for instance, um, the book kind of called me out personally for carrying a hydro flask with me all the time. Right. That they say, well, that could indicate um, a person's social standing. Like, it's sure, it's eco friendly, but it's also expensive. Right. For many years, I didn't have one because it just didn't seem like it was worth the price. Right. Or you can see people wearing like really expensive, you know, tennis shoes that they're not. It's like the shoes aren't for what the shoes are for. They're not for like wearing them around. They're for status, right? And this could even be, you know, all sorts of stuff that people wear is really much more about the trend or the status than it is about, you know, um, other expressions. So, you know, a car that you spend a couple grand on, it works the same as a car you spend over a hundred grand on, right? But a luxury car makes a social statement that a less expensive car can't live up to. Like I remember going through this situation myself. I was teaching for probably the first six years or so of teaching. I was driving around this little beater car that like the the mirrors like would fall off and <laughs> like the rear view mirror would just keep coming undone. And my, um, what's it called? My visor would never stay up and I had to like duct tape it up. The whole thing, it was just really shoddy, but I remember being worried when students might see me in my car and then it would somehow make them see me as less credible as a professor because why would I be driving such a crappy car? It's like, well, because I'm broke and I had student debt and I was like everyone else, right? So, but the idea is that you're supposed to have this kind of image of yourself that fits with certain, you know, job criteria and that somehow that can actually negatively impact your status or at least the way people interpret your credibility based on this stuff as if somehow rich people are just more credible, which is obviously not the case, but it's our social bias that leads us to feel this way. So all of these symbols of stratification are just, you know, something that interactionists want to understand and see how we actually engage with and interact with social class within our daily lives.